recording. And we are going to start with acetylcholine. So Jack and Tyler, take it away. Yep, so Tyler and I had um, acetylcholine. So the source of the signal is an arrival of a nerve impulse at the neuromuscular junction, which causes lots of tiny vesicles filled with um, acetylcholine to be released from the axon tip into the synapse. And then the type of signaling is synaptic signaling. And then the receptor um, at a neuromuscular junction, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, NACHR, and then this is a ligand-gated ion channel. Um, so the, here's a photo of the um, acetylcholine. And so the cellular response, protein activation, nuclear response, transcription factor activation, growth, cell division, nutrient mobilization, generation of action potential, and antibody production, cell death, ap apoptosis. Um, other information, it was the first transmitter to be discovered. It's the most abundant transmitter um, in the human body, and it is responsible for muscle movement, memory, arousal, and attention. Um, and then could you play the video and then start it at second 46? Yep. 46 seconds. Yep. Give me just a second to switch this Fighting over. Oh, Grammarly, Grammarly ad. Helps. This sentence is grammatically correct. Welcome to 2-Minute right. Neuroscience. And 46 seconds. Neuroscience topics in 2 minutes or less. There we a, go. Acetylcholine acts on two families of receptors. And each receptor family has several subtypes. One family is ionotropic. They're called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors because nicotine also binds to and activates the receptors. Their activation generally results in excitation of the neuron. Another family is metabotropic. These are called muscarinic acetylcholine receptors because a substance called muscarin binds to them. Their effects depend on the subtype of the receptor. The action of acetylcholine in the synapse is terminated by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase which breaks acetylcholine down into acetate and choline. The choline is then transported back into neurons to synthesize more acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has a variety of functions in the nervous system. It is the main neurotransmitter used at neuromuscular junctions and is responsible for muscle contraction. It is also widely used in the autonomic nervous system. Its functions in the brain are still not fully understood, but it does appear to play important roles in memory, arousal, and attention. All right, and give me a second. Yep, yeah. yeah, give me a second to switch back here. All right, anything else? Um, no, that'll be all. All right. Dopamine, is Ashley O here yet? Sounds like maybe not. Ashley C, do you want to do this now or should we come back if she shows up or do it on Monday? Oh, oh she just jumped. I just saw that. Ashley, you're right in time. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm so sorry. My computer hasn't been working well. I'm so sorry. No worries. You are exactly on time. We just got to your slide. So you guys are up. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, so as a signal, um, dopamine is a neural hormone that is released by the hypothalamus, um, specifically in the, by the dopamine gener generic neurons that are in the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area in the brain, part of, which is part of the hypothalamus. And then for type of signaling, um, it's actually both paracrine or paracrine and synaptic because um, synaptic signaling is actually just a specific kind. And so basically just the chemical messengers transfer the signal across the synapse, which you can see in the picture that's in the middle, um, to the D1 and D2 protein receptors. And then the type of receptor that it is with the D1-like receptor signaling, it is G proteins, galphas, and galphalof. And the D2-like receptor signaling are the G proteins, Gelfi and Gelfo. The cellular response is dopamine helps communicate messages across different parts of the brain and between the brain and the rest of the body. It also plays an important role 
and like executive function, motor control, motivation, arousal, reinforcement, and rewards. And then for other information, I just had that Parkinson's disease is caused by the loss of dopamine, by, by the loss of dopamine secreting neurons that lead to motor impairment. All right. Anything else you have for us, ladies? No, I think that's it. All yeah. right. Then our third neurotransmitter here is serotonin, Leah and Brooke. Okay. We had serotonin and the source of the signal, it's um, neurons in the Reiki nuclei in the midline of the brainstem and also in the peripheral organs. Um, the type of signaling is uh, the pairs current or yep. uh, messenger utilized by EC cells, which function as sensory transducers. And then the type of receptor is a G protein coupled in uh, its ligand gated ion channel. And then some cellul cellular responses are vascular smooth cells respond by synthesizing glycoproteins for regulating immune responses. Um, white blood cells are stimulated, the monocytes and lymphocytes, and then which they secrete proteins. And then serotonin is utilized by enterochromaffin cells, which are endocrine cells. And then some other information, it affects behaviors such as mood, anger, morality, and memory. And then it affects, or its physical effects are vascular resistance, blood pressure, and other cardiac functions. All right. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to come back to this one in just a minute. Um, so you heard there a couple of things. Oh, hang on. i got to switch my tabs over. Um, so you heard there are a couple of different examples of the types of receptors that um, those neurotransmitters bond with. Um, you heard people talk about both the ligand-gated ion channels and the G-coupled protein receptors, which we had talked about before. Um, and this is a slide that you have in your packet. You don't need to find it right now. Um, but just so you know, that's there for you. The ion channels open up um, so ions can diffuse in and out, which can lead to that either depolarization or hyperpolarization that can either cause or prevent action potentials. Um, the G-coupled protein receptors initiate that signal transduction pathway like they talked about, and it tends to amplify the signal. So just one neurotransmitter can end up opening a lot of ion channels. One other thing I wanna mention about these, and this will come up again when we talk about the endocrine system, um, but sometimes depending on exactly where these neurotransmitters act, one neurotransmitter can have different effects in different parts of the body. So like um, acetylcholine, which is one that they just talked about, when it bonds with skeletal muscles, um, it bonds with a receptor protein that's an ion channel, and when it opens up, it promotes muscle contraction. But in your heart, it bonds with a different type of receptor protein. It's the exact same signaling molecule, but the receptor's different. And so it triggers a different response. So these pathways, another reason for having so many steps in these pathways is that having different receptor proteins and different molecules in the pathway allows different parts of your body to respond differently to the same signal, the same neurotransmitter, or the same hormone. Um, the next type of signaling we're going to talk about is immune system signaling. And we're just going to touch on this one really briefly. There's just one group that's going to present here. Um, but cell signaling is also important to the immune system and kind of how you recognize your body recognize path, recognizes pathogens. So Luke and Jordan, you are up. Okay. Is Jordan here? Yeah, I'm here. Stop, Jordan. Stop. Okay, uh, I'll start then. So we had the antigen and humoral uh, immune response. And so kind of a quick summary right away. Um, so the antigen and the B cell, the B cell, if you can kind of see my grammar there, it's kind of hard to read that. But uh, 
uh, in, in, the antigen encounters the B cell and the B cell kind of in, engulfs it. Um, so then it uh, kind of combines and makes, um, it triggers the antibody molecules. And then it kind of secretes the plasma cells, which then connect to, um, it sends a signal through. So the source of the signal comes from the original antigen. And then the antibodies are released through the B cells. If that makes sense. And so the type of signaling is the it's cell to cell contact kind of the antigen has to make contact with the B cell and it uses a helper T cells to kind of help um, that process. So the antigen attaches to the B cell and then it will cause the antibodies to be secreted, which is what that humoral immune response is. So Jordan, if you want to take the receptor and the cellular response. Yeah, so the type of receptor, it's a B cell antigen receptor. Um, it's transmembrane cell surface receptor and has like CD4. And then the type of response, it's an antibody production. Um, so the white blood cells will then do the rest of the work um, by attaching to more, and like matching more of the antigens. And we've also got a video link in there too. All right. Do you want me to play? The video is like less than a Oops. minute and it um, kind of just goes through. Okay. I will pull that up. And then also the name antigen is because it... Sorry. um, It can generate antibodies, so antigen. I don't think I ever knew that. That's kind of cool. Okay. I will start this over unmuted. Here we go. So that would be the antigen connecting to the B cell, and then those are the receptors. It's kind of a cool animation. All right, anything else you had to tell us about this? Don't think so, no. All right. So um, the immune system, um, as they said in there, um, you guys did a nice job of kind of summarizing how important that cell to cell contact is. I actually threw this slide in because fourth hour did not have any groups presenting on the immune system. Um, But this just kind of shows you how a couple of main cells in the immune system, both the um, helper T cell, which you see kind of in the middle, I put the letter T on it, um, needs to actually contact a white blood cell that has already encountered that pathogen in order to be activated and secrete chemicals that kill the cells. Um, And then like they said, the bottom right picture is kind of the part that that group just presented on those helper T cells. Again, needs cell to cell contact with the B cells in order to trigger those B cells to start releasing antibodies. Um, You saw this diagram back when we um, did the ELISA lab before you left, kind of summarizing the immune system. Um, the left half of it is labeled the humoral response, and that's basically those antibodies that protect against pathogens in your bloodstream. The right hand is um, the part of the immune system that actually fights against viruses or bacteria that are already in your body cells, so it kills infected cells. But all of your immune system require cells that actually physically contact each other to transfer that signal. Plants do also have immune systems. They don't work exactly the same, but I threw in just one slide here just to show you that plant immune systems also rely on cell signaling pathways. So it could be triggered by a protein or some other molecule that's part of a pathogen like a bacteria. Um, And when that interacts with a plant cell, it leads to a signal transduction pathway that can lead to different types of immune responses. It could be the production of chemicals to kill those invaders. It could be strengthening of the cell wall. But just so you're aware, we don't talk a ton about plants, but plants also have these types of signaling pathways um, and these types of defenses. 
The other place that we see a ton of cell signaling is in the endocrine system. And um, endocrine signaling, again, is a little bit different than the nervous system. We talked about the nervous system first. Um, the nervous system sends signals along one specific route between neurons. It's really fast, it's really specific, and the signals are really brief. The endocrine system that we're gonna be talking about for most of the rest of these presentations um, releases hormones that circulate through your entire body. Um, and so it's much more general. It can affect a lot of different parts of your body and it tends to last longer because those hormones just continue to float around in your bloodstream for a while. So we're gonna look at several different hormones here and we're gonna do these in a slightly different order because Abby needs to leave in just a little bit. So we are gonna start here with um, human growth hormone. So Abby Lee and Grace, you are up. Perfect. Grace, you want to start? Yeah. Okay. So we had the human growth hormone and the source of signal is it comes from the pituitary gland. So that's where like the growth signal is released. And that is located at like the base of the brain and it is like the size of a pea. And then the pituitary gland is made up of like two glands fused together. And that is the posterior and anterior. And the type of signaling is endocrine and it signals molecules that are released into the bloodstream and then it carries it throughout the body. Yeah, so the human growth hormone um, leaves the brain basically and it goes to like muscles and bones, um, which is why it has a bunch of different receptors. It's part of the cytokine receptor family, which has 30 plus receptors. Some of the examples of those are prolactin receptor, Erinth I don't know how to say that, receptor, and thrombi protein receptor. And basically in this picture, you can see the first picture, which is the top left, the um, receptor is getting ready for the human growth hormone to come. And that's kind of the same as the bottom left picture, uh, part A, and then part B is when the human growth hormone finally like attaches to the receptor. And then it sends out um, a bunch of signals from there. Um, and then the cellular response to that is in response to the human growth hormone cells, it produces a jack um, enzyme and the jack enzyme activates the stat, which is a signal transducer molecules. And then this produces IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor. So basically in like not fancy terms, the human growth hormone comes into the receptor and it produces the jack molecule, which activates all these different things and it produces this IGF-1, which makes things grow. So it makes your muscles grow, it makes your bones grow. And basically that gets distributed all throughout the body um, to signal growth of cells. Yeah, and then some other info, it has like a major role in like growth and growth of like bone and cartilage. And then it also helps with like metabolism development, um, energy, and then it also repairs and maintains tissue and then it has um, possible development of cancer and then we also have a video on it the video is a little long but it makes a lot of sense okay and today i'm going to be talking about the human growth hormone it is important to note that the hormone originates from just under the brain from the hypothalamus and then from the anterior pituitary gland the process begins when the hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone, which travels to the pituitary and binds to the somatotroph, a type of cell. This interaction yields growth hormone, which is then secreted from the anterior pituitary. Now this growth hormone can travel through the body and do its job. The growth hormone can now act on the liver binding to the growth hormone receptor and activating an enzyme known as JAK, Janus kinase, which then phosphorylates and activates the signal transducer and activator of transcription, or STAT molecules. As a result, a series of signals is sent, ending in the ultimate production of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factors. These IGF-1 promote linear bone development, stimulate muscle growth, and increase insulin resistance. The growth factor is can then distribute throughout the body. 
By binding to muscle cells, IGF-1 increases the amount of amino acids in the muscles and allows for more proteins to be produced, which increases the size of the muscles. When IGF-1 binds to bone cells, which are responsible for the size of the bone, it results in an increase in collagen, increase in bone mass, and an increase in bone growth activity. Human growth hormone also causes an increase in blood glucose levels. Human growth hormones are what cause changes in our bodies as we grow older, and they are another essential part of human life. All right. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. This one. Anything else for us, Abilene and Grace? Um, the only other thing that I had is that the human growth hormone is really important. And if it gets messed up, it will develop cancer because of all like the different things. And I thought that was really interesting that that's what mainly causes cancer in like little kids. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Thanks. The next one, aldosterone, Austin and Gabby. Okay. So a little bit about the source of signal. Um, it's produced on the outer section of the adrenal glands, and that's located right above the kidney. And then um, for the type of receptor, um, it has an MR, which is a part of the nuclear receptor family, and it's also ligand dependent. And for a type of signaling, I found that it was an autocrine and a paracrine system. And the hormone stimulates ATP release from the vasolateral side of the target kidney cell. And for cellular response, it regulates sodium and potassium levels by acting on the mineral corticoid receptors in the distal tubules and collecting ducts of the nephron. And then it stimulates the excretion of sodium and potassium from the tubular lumen. And other information that we found was that the aldosterone is a steroid in the body that regulates salt and water, which has an effect on blood pressure and volume. All right. And, uh, that is it. Yeah. That's it? All right. Yep. Our next hormone in here is epinephrine, which is one that you've maybe heard of before. Jade, what do you think? Do you want to talk today or do you want to wait? Um, yeah, I can just do my part and Autumn can do hers when she gets back. Okay, take it away. So epinephrine is secreted in the adrenal glands located in the kidneys, more specifically the chromo chromaffin cells in the medulla of the adrenal gland produce epinephrine. And then the epinephrine binds to a G protein coupled cell in or on and around muscle cells. And then the video link autumn added, so I don't know if we want to watch that or not. Okay, let's just check it out real quick, just because epinephrine's a pretty well-known one. Let's see what we've got here. Let's see if it'll let me show this whole thing. The adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys. If you were to slice an adrenal gland in half, you would notice that it is more like two separate endocrine glands in one. The outer adrenal cortex secretes steroid hormones, and the central adrenal medulla is stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system to secrete catecholamines, which are hormones that help you deal with short-term stress. In this lesson, you will learn about two catecholamines from the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine and how they help you cope with everyday stressful situations. Now, it is not often that we see an endocrine gland stimulated by the nervous system. However, this is the case with the adrenal medulla. When you feel scared or physically threatened, your sympathetic nervous system springs into action to prepare you for fight or flight. For instance, if you are out for a peaceful hike in the woods and all of a sudden a bear appears, your sympathetic nervous system sends split-second impulses that help you make the decision to stay and fight 
or take flight. I recommend taking flight. One of the glands that the sympathetic nervous system stimulates is the adrenal medulla. Upon stimulation, the gland secretes its hormones into the... Well, it's not going to let us finish that one, but that's okay. That was pretty long anyway, and that's a good introduction to how these things work together. Jade, is there anything else that you want to share about this, or is the rest stuff Autumn is going to talk about? The rest is Autumn's information. Okay, we will come back to epinephrine later. Next, we have human epidural growth factor, Ashlyn and Alexis. So we have a human epidural growth factor. Um, yeah. Uh, the source of the signal, uh, EGFR initiates the signaling inside epithelial cells and tumors of the epithelial region. EGF is a 53 amino acid polypeptide, which can be found in salivary glands in the kidneys. Some of the ligands that connects to the EGFR, so EGF transforming growth factor A, amphigurlin, bactelian, heparin binding epidermal growth factor, and epigurlin. Um, the receptor is, is a protein that's involved in cell signaling pathways and is very important in cell division and help the cell survive. Um, the receptor is the tyro tyrosine kinase and if that gets like mutated in any kind of way that's like a big part of cancer cells and like um because the proteins are like getting made faster there's a lot of cellular responses egf can stimulate the cell growth and differentiation it stimulates hepatocyte proliferation Ashlyn, are you still there? Oh. Ashlyn, are you still there? I can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. I, yeah, my internet's really bad sometimes. Sorry. That's okay. You just cut out in the middle of talking about the responses. Okay. So EGF can stimulate the cell growth and differentiation, stimulates hepatocytal proliferation in culture, induces hepatitic DNA synthesis, and helps with liver regeneration. All right, anything else you two? No. All right, insulin, Grace and Maya. Okay, so I can start. We had um, insulin, and the source of the signal is the insulin is secreted by groups of B cells in the pancreas. So essentially, when you eat and your food is broken down with starches in it, the, um, you'll have elevated glucose levels in your blood, and the pancreas will detect that and um, secrete insulin into the bloodstream. Uh, the type of signaling is endocrine, um, the hormone, which is insulin, will um, act on target cells that will then help those cells um, facilitate glucose uptake, uptake to regulate the level of the bloodstream. Um, and then the type of receptor, it's made up of two extracellular and two transmembrane subunits. So the two extracellular um, is what the insulin will bind to. Um, and then that will create like a chain of events where the different things will bond to each other and create the reaction. Um, and the subunits are connected by disulfide bond. Um, okay, so for the cellular response, insulin stimulates amino acid uptake into cells and it inhibits protein de um, degradation and promotes protein synthesis. Um, so it's indicated what the synthesis requires an increase in the uh, transcription factor steroid regulatory element binding protein. Um, insulin enhances glucose uptake because of specific facilitative um, glucose transport protein isoform. Um, following insulin stimulation, the protein undergoes redistribution to the cell surface, increasing the uh, number of glucose transporters um, and increasing glucose uptake. 
And um, for other information, um, there's just like specific cells um, where influence does like specific things like influence suppresses that whole thing. <laughs> like, um, and yeah, strain muscle and, and opposed tissue also. And also, we have a video um, that I found it explains really well the like the pathway that it goes through. I think it does a good job of explaining it, but it's kind of long. So if you want to skip to like 35 seconds, I think that's when it starts actually explaining the pathway. Sure. Focusing on skeletal muscle and adipose tissue cells. The interaction between insulin and its receptor travels to the interior of the cell, where it triggers a number of changes in cell metabolism, including glucose uptake by cells in response to elevated blood glucose levels. This process is known as the insulin signaling pathway. The insulin receptor is a dimer made of two extracellular alpha subunits and two transmembrane beta subunits. Disulfide bonds connect the alpha and beta subunits as well as the two alpha subunits to maintain the receptor as a dimer. Now we're going to go through the initial steps of the insulin signaling pathway. Insulin binds to the alpha subunits of the insulin receptor, which face the extracellular environment. This interaction translates to the beta subunits, which have tyrosine kinase domains that become activated to phosphorylate each other and other proteins. IRS1 binds to the phosphorylated tyrosine residues, which then results in the phosphorylation of IRS1. The phosphorylated sites on IRS1 serve as binding sites for the PI3 kinase. PI3 kinase phosphorylates PIP2, a membrane phospholipid. The addition of the phosphate converts PIP2 to PIP3, which serves as a recognition site for the PIP3-dependent protein kinase, or PDK1 for short. PDK1 phosphorylates AKT, another protein kinase, which further relays the signal to the interior of the cell. This cascade involves many subsequent steps and proteins not shown here. In tissues such as skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, all these steps eventually lead to the recruitment of additional glucose transporters from storage in intracellular vesicles to the plasma membrane in order to facilitate glucose transport into cells. Glucose transporters are transmembrane channel proteins that allow glucose to travel from outside the cell to inside, decreasing blood glucose levels. Skeletal muscle and adipose. Okay, is it okay if I pause it there or do you wanna watch the last couple of minutes? No, that's that's about like what it was talking about. It just kind of goes into more detail about um, what happens after. Okay, that, but... I really like that animation. Um, that did a really good job of kind of showing you what these cascades look like and how the transfer of phosphates is important. So that's a good one. I might save that one in the future. All right, do you have um, more to tell us on this one or was that kind of the last thing? I think that's about it. It's just... All right. So we only have two more. We are almost finished for today. The last topic that we have here, just to introduce this real quickly, um, animals are not the only things that have hormones. Plants also have molecules that act as signaling molecules. Um, they're not exactly the same as what we normally think of for hormones. And so sometimes they're called plant growth regulators, but they're still molecules that signal plants to perform specific processes. So we have two of these that we're going to talk about briefly for our last two presentations. So Christina and Kylie, take it away. Okay, so we did auxin and it's a plant cell. And it's produced in the stem, buds, and the root tips. It is also in the sap, and it moves through the phloem. And it can also pass from cell to cell. The type of signaling is, like, it's a hormone, so it's produced for the plant to help it grow. Okay, so for the type of the, the receptor, it's called an auxin binding protein. It's the main receptor, and that's the one I could find the most information on. Um, one of the sites said it was plasma membrane associated, and for that reason, I thought it was a transmembrane receptor, seeing as it is associated with the plasma membrane. 
And then the response, it basically allows the plant to grow by stimulating cell division in the stem. And since the cells are dividing in the stem, it allows the stem to get longer. Um, so that's how it is a growth hormone for the plant. And then, yeah, it just basically regulates the growth um, and it's control in control of the elongation of the stem of the plant. Awesome. Anything else? Okay. And then the other plant hormone we have here is gibberellin, Mary and Ben. Um, we did the gibberellin, uh, the source of it is the, in the seeds and young leaves and roots, it is also in plant cells. The type of signaling it has is endocrine. And since it's like a plant hormone, it like helps release the growth hormones in this plant. Through the plant. Um, so the cellular response that it gives, um, it kind of does like, kind of promotes um, pretty much everything. It promotes growth, flowering, stem and root elongation, growth of fruit, seed germination, and cellular growth. And um, like a fun fact is that the production of um, gibberellin increases in lower temperatures. And um, biologists use um, control of gibberellin to like uh, kind of manage their plants they have in, in greenhouses and whatnot to keep it um, well manageable and like um, farmers can use different seeds with uh, different gibberellin properties to increase their yield in certain plants and stuff. Cool. All right. I think that was the last one, right? Okay, so last minute or two just to kind of wrap this up for today. Thanks for sticking with. I know this is a little long, but I wanted to get these presentations done today. Oh, we just talked about that. Go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so one additional thing that you can look into if you are interested, this video is linked in the slides right to this picture of the video. Um, it's a TED talk, it's about 15 minutes long that talks about how this kind of cell signaling also happens in bacteria. Um, and it's kind of cool because it talks about how like when you're first exposed to um, a disease causing bacteria, you don't get sick instantly, basically because there aren't enough bacteria in your body. Um, and they kind of communicate with each other so that they know when there are enough bacteria that they can actually start producing the toxins and chemicals and things to make you sick. So that's there just if you're interested. I just wanted to point out this doesn't only happen in plants and animals. It also happens in um, prokaryotes as well. So like I said, there is a short reflection. It should really only take you five or 10 minutes, especially if you do it right away while this is all fre fresh in your brain. Um, I attached it on today's lesson in classroom, not in the homework section, mainly because I just wasn't thinking. Um, but it's a Google form linked on today's post. So please finish that by Monday. And again, thank you all for sticking with for this slightly longer than normal class so that we can